the last few people could take their seats or make the decision about where they're going, um, we'll be getting underway. All right, for our final um, talk before lunch, um, we're going to have Julian Goodwin talking to us about all those alerts. A microphone. Of course, I don't need another one. Um, so, in a way, this is a continuation of a variety of talks myself and Jamie have given, uh, Jamie Wilkinson have given over the years here. So, at the start, and this is where many companies still are, you have no silencing at all. You have all these things, they fire alerts, maybe they go to a dashboard, maybe they go to a pager. Maybe they don't really go anywhere, but you're meant to be looking at them. And what happens is you have these maintenance events. And you start out with going, well, we know these alerts are going to happen, but we're just looking at a dashboard, we'll just ignore them. And this is also bad because you can have significant outages leading to alert overload. And you might think your knock people or support org or your own team are smart and they'll correlate these and that's all fine. It's really easy to miscorrelate alerts. It's incredibly easy to misread that is node six, not node eight. And so that alert is not correlated with that or actually someone misconfigured something because it's still manual. And knowing what's expected rapidly becomes impossible to track. If you are a CDN with 40 locations, which three have work on at the moment? And the trigger for this talk was actually some work I was doing with a large telco a couple months ago who, while working on migrating some network links, they wanted me to roll something back because it was in their process they had to see these specific alerts, which uh, happened to be around BGP. They wanted to see the BGP session in a specific transient state so we could move on to the next state and I happened to move too fast for them. And this led to a whole depressing discussion about how telcos work. But I know this happens in others. I've seen a recent article on one of Australia's major telcos and it basically describes how they effectively do the same thing. They might, I don't know in deep to say how well they do it, but telcos, this is a telco thing at real scale. Okay, so we have alerts going to pages or dashboards. We're doing work. We'll, we'll just turn it all off. And you can at some scales. If you're a small business with one main site and you've got to rebuild the one server rack, sure, go ahead. Perfectly reasonable. Stops working when you've got the stuff in the office and the stuff at the colo or two offices, etc. Can work. If it works for you, more power. Uh, when you have a couple locations, you start maybe turning off locations. If you're, again, the CDN example, maybe you can just turn off alerting for your, for your system while you're working on it. Um, just because you turn off the alerting, of course, doesn't mean you don't also have the alerts going to a dashboard or similar that you can verify or in fact have a tool that just says what alerts are firing before you finish the work. This helps somewhat, but as the example there says, what happens if my work at a site is taking out the service because I'm upgrading a database system, migrating to the next MongoDB that's not pwned this week, and the router goes down? That's a completely valid alert. It's not caused by my work, but if I've silenced the whole site, well, I won't say it. Can you give me one? No. So next you start looking at turning off expected alerts. You either manually by clicky clicky some things or with a, hopefully with the aid of a tool pretty quickly, you turn off what alerts you expect from maintenance. And then starts to have fun with making sure you get it right. And of course, 
you'll inevitably either forget to trigger things or just go, this is all too hard, select all. So next you link up change management system. Realistically, by the time this is a problem, you're going to have some form of change management tracking. Even if it's a bug in your bug tracker and nothing more. These are great because you can just add a field. You might already have these fields. You just now start validating that when someone lists the machines they're working on, those are actual machines. And you can use that as a trigger for sound systems. And again, if you've got these change management systems, you probably have a way to say, this change has started, this change has finished. And you link that with your silence removals. Um, depending on how your alerts are written, you may, of course, have alerts that fire for periods of unavailability. So mark and complete might not actually remove silences. It might say silences now expire in 20 minutes. Um, if your alerts are, this system has been up for at least 20 minutes out of the last 30. But you start to get to things too small to track. Uh, what if I'm doing, what if I have a 20 rack CDN node because I'm someone big um, and I just want to reboot rack sequentially in a way that doesn't matter. I might have an overarching change, but I'm not going to have, I'm not going to want to file 20 manual changes. Maybe you automate it, maybe you partition it, maybe you don't do it this way. And what if that change is actually, oops, Cisco had a security hole, Juno had a security hole, we need to patch the entire network in 24 hours. And that might be a time where the integration can't work just because of so many overlapping changes. So this is where you start to get into the value. Um, alert inhibition or alert dependencies is sort of the most simple simpler version of it, is more just the basic of service dependencies where you go, the router is down, therefore don't alert on the machines behind the router. The next step is, I have indicated that the CDN service in this location is down because the, GS, the global load balancer configuration says this site is out of service, therefore don't alert for web servers that are part of the CDN in this location. And the way you do this in a lot of systems is to some degree or another you fire a goes nowhere alert. So you simply fire an alert whose destination is a dashboard that's never looked at, which is the inhibition alerts. Um, And this is valuable. So you very quickly then get into the danger point, which is, well, what if I do too much of this? What if my script that reboots racks goes a bit nuts and accidentally reboots half the racks in the world? This is when you start adding alerts that monitor global capacity, global availability. You alert on oops, it looks like too many locations are out of service. Oops, it looks like someone um, filed a change to touch everything in production at once. And one of the last ones is if you have a nice simple silence infrastructure that takes nice arbitrary regular expressions, at some point someone will accidentally silence dot star. Probably repeatedly. Um, the way one way to fix this is if you have um, arbitrary groupings that you can only silence on one of those groupings, you can trigger, you might be able to trigger alerts that, you can essentially wire up alerts that are always firing, going nowhere, and then a second alert that's always firing that's inhibited by the first always firing alert, and silencing the always firing alert that's in your normal batch of alerts, then triggers the alert that you wouldn't have silenced and that way, you that way you get paged if someone accidentally silences the world again. Um, it's the sort of thing that it's not valuable hugely. What usually happens is you silence the world and you say, 
it's been a bit quiet the last couple of days. And then you discover something broken that you know you have alerting for, and you look and you go, ah, crap. Happens. Now, this all sounds like a wonderful world to live in, but a lot of us don't. And the getting there from here is hard, because I've just sort of said you should completely structure your alerts probably quite differently to how you're doing it. Um, I know many of us have built many monitoring systems over the years. And I've done many Nagios configuration systems in the past. I've worked with um, uh, Borg, which is similar to Prometheus these days. And you can do all these neat inhibits and dependencies, but it looks so scary and I don't really want to do it and I'm not entirely sure of it, so I'll just do the basic stuff. And then you don't really want to rewrite it. And the thing is, that's a big job and if you do a big rewrite, you're always going to miss things or you're always going to stuff things up. And of course, it's major stress. Don't. If you're on a basically okay monitoring system, just improve it. Get a bad alert. Get an alert for there's too little traffic on this network link was one of our bad ones in the past. And it was some of our people actually used it as a prime example of a bad alert and did nothing about it. But once it happened to fire for me one day and I got it and went, that is a bad alert, let's turn it off. And if every alert, and you can't do it from the start, Maybe just look at the stats out of your alerting system, find out what alerts fire. You might be surprised, if, especially if you go through a uh, knock type system where alerts come to a dashboard and people acknowledge them and route them or ignore them, quite how often some alerts fire. And even more often, how often they fire, a ticket is opened, it then gets auto-closed because no one touched it. Pull the stats, figure out what are the top three alerts that are probably a bit dodgy and do one thing to each of them that makes them a little bit better. And if you keep doing that, you pretty rapidly recover time. Um, my own team used to have several people 24 by 7 on machines and dashboards. We're now back towards a more traditional for Google mechanism where people get paged when things happen and they get much, much fewer alerts than we used to have. And mostly that's not actually because we've made anything particularly better. It's because we've improved our alerting so we are alerting on the right things, we're silencing on the right things. Um, one thing I didn't actually cover here. If, say, I lose a power supply in a router, might be worth filing a bug on to get replaced, but it's probably more worthwhile to file a bug on to get it replaced once it's been down for a couple of hours, that way I don't need to care about Colos doing power maintenances without telling me. Colos flipping the supplies. I'll find out. If it's actually broken, I probably wasn't going to be on site that night anyway. I would have just gone, oh, single power supply, it's redundant, who cares? So using delays is also a good way to reduce your alert volume here. And just improve. You can really get to a point where you are responsible for a large collection of critical things, getting an alert or two a week, and some bugs to work on, some tickets, bugs, depending on how you refer to them, to work on. But it takes effort. And to get to that scale, it's harder. Um, as a team that works a lot with external parties on networks, I can only do so much. A majority of our alerts come ultimately from the fact that we connect to external networks. Those connections are not perfect. We wish those connections were usually bigger. And there's problems that result from that. Um, various large ISPs on the planet have different network designs than we assume people have, and that can hurt us. So we can do so much, but we can't be perfect. But we can continually improve, we can get rid of the other things, and then we can figure out how do we design our systems? How can we work with our developers to make it so that when these congestion events happen, smarter systems take hold instead of us humans having to deal with it. But we can do that because we got rid of a lot of the junk alerts, so we know this is what will need serious dev work. Well. 
and that's it. Any final questions, or do people want to escape for lunch? So it's still officially about five minutes for lunch. I think there are some is some food out there, but if anyone has any questions. <laughs> What's your favourite monitoring system? Um, if I was to use one that was in public and open source, I would probably try and use Prometheus. I am not the world's biggest fan of Go, um, but I've now spent several years dealing with Borgmon, which Prometheus is quite heavily inspired by. So that structure of a time series database and alerting um, based on it has sort of wormed its way in. Uh, there's quite a lot of neat stuff now. I think what I wonder about when I've gone looking has been we're starting to get the log collection or the um, data collection systems there and we've got the graphing systems but the graphing systems don't necessarily want to talk, the good graphing system doesn't necessarily want to talk to the good TSDB systems. Um, maybe in another two or three years that'll shake out a bit more. Um, I mean, something I will say that's incredibly valuable and you won't know it until you've had a system that uses it is when you can store, say, for example, uh, light levels on a radar optic turns out that pulling up a year's worth or a year and a half's worth of radar optic light levels every now and again, really useful. You can tell that this has actually been a very slow degrade over three months or six months or this same thing happened last year. And if you don't collect the data, you never know. There's, I mean, there's something like a hundred variables for every rat physical port on our routers that we capture, 99 point something percent of that data we will never look at. 95% isn't even used in any alerts or trigger systems. But for one, one or two interfaces a day, we'll get pulled one or two random things and it will help us solve a problem. It's quite an astonishing amount of data when you sort of add it up coming from I will alert if the box says I'm unhealthy, but it really does mean you go, oh, this link is down, oh, no light, did it. Actually, it's been failing in this way. It's probably not us, it's probably someone has sliced a fiber and then put weight on it to cause it to degrade in this fashion because of the curve from the optic levels versus uh, there's something bad with the light I didn't, now. Um, can we swap the optic and the, oh, still bad. Uh, carrier, help. So ha having the data that can help you root cause. Is cool. And that's, you won't know it until you get it. I mean, the comment before about missing the log line you want. Sort of inevitable. But if you make sure you then have that log line the next time this happens, and maybe the alert should have linked you to a dashboard it didn't. That's the, the way to get better. It's just that continual improvement and yeah, you will miss stuff. You mentioned Nargios earlier. If you've got a Nargios system and you've got a service check that you've decided is a bad one that you want to silence, um, how do you go about that? Would you put it, change its configuration so it's contacting a, a dev null contact group? Yeah, ultimately that's probably the easiest way to make it effectively a dashboard only alert. Um, and then, yeah, and then you can use that. Um, we have the notions of testing alerts that go into different dashboards that we can look at. And often we just, I mean, more than once a year we discover oh, this problem happened. Why didn't we get any good, good alerts for it? Oh, someone did write an alert. They just put it in testing and forgot about it. That's going to happen. Again, it's sort of, at some point, keeping your on-call sanity becomes worth it because what happens, the, the converse is you have 10,000 alerts and people know to ignore them. And you might not believe they know to ignore them, 
but that's what actually happens. Um, you will, uh, we found we got a new person in our team a, a while back and for whatever, his job that day was to r perform analysis of what's going to happen when we do this maintenance work. And he tried to use the process. And half the team was screaming at him, no, 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 don't use the process for this, it's completely bull. We didn't actually fix the process and that was, so it stayed completely useless and nonsensical. Okay, so it's um, pretty much lunchtime now. I think we've got one more question and then we'll call it. Hopefully this isn't too much of a long one. Um, do you do much like log and service-based alerting or do you normally try and alert on metrics so that way when doing maintenance and service go down sort of like you're still getting like uh, response stuff on the outside? Um, we do both. Working with vendor router equipment, it turns out there's a bunch of stuff that is only going to syslog. So we actually have gateways from syslog into more traditional monitoring systems, um, from SNMP into our monitoring systems. And we do that, we, for some things, for example, straight rate of log messages can be useful for a whole lot of stuff. Routers will alert that something's a bit weird, but we don't actually care, because a lot of these are sort of common or transient states. But if it's doing that at 100 log lines a second for 10 minutes, probably a broken router. Or maybe the router next to it's broken. Useful in, in qualifying. So not, we try to avoid single log message fire page, but every now and again we have to do that because that really is the dying gasp sign of a router. And it's really helpful to know not just router dead, router dead because its backplane exploded. And sometimes you get signals like that from devices. And if you have enough of them, you learn. If you run a data center full of old um, Cisco 3750 switches, you eventually learn, here's the 20 ways these most commonly fail. If we fire our alerts on this switch has died due to this problem, you start being able to open a ticket with Cisco going, we had another one for this. If you're a big enough customer, they go, okay, here you go. All right. All right, fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, lunch is on now. We'll resume here at 1.20.